Spain, 80 BC, just off the coast near the Pillars of Hercules, today's Straits of Gibraltar. A man and his small force are about to make a landfall. He's here to retake the Iberian Peninsula for the populist faction he's been fighting for in a civil war started by two men, Gaius Marius and Lucius Cornelius Sulla. Quintus Sertorius will spend the next eight years defeating multiple Roman generals sent to destroy him and will remain a constant problem for the ruling faction back in Rome until 73 BC and his demise at the hands of his own men. Hello there. In this video, I'm going to take a look at the Sertorian War, which was a civil war fought between a portion of the Marian faction under the leadership of Quintus Sertorius and the Sullans, who controlled the Roman state at the time. The Sullans were led by Lucius Cornelius Sulla, the first man in Roman history to seize power of the state through force and violence. This war could also be considered another chapter in the generations-long struggle between the Optimates and Populares. But for this video, I'm going to focus on Quintus and his life and the war that bears his name. Because if I were to get into the whole Marius versus Sulla story, that would take hours and hours, and I'd probably just only be getting to the start of the Civil War, since those two men live such interesting lives on their own accord. And then when their stories come together, it gets even more nuts. So I'm going to try to not go off on any tangents about things that don't matter to the story. But um, let's be honest here. Everything has something to do with Rome, right? But Quintus was born in the former land of the Sabines, which was conquered by Rome in 290 BC and given citizenship 50 years later. It was sometime between 120 and 123 BC that historians give for his birth date, in a small town named Nursia. His family was quite wealthy and part of the equestrian class in ancient Rome, the social class just below the senatorial and patrician classes, which allowed Sertorius to have the best education a young man could hope to get at this time in the world. His father died when he was just a young boy, but it's said that his mother, Rhea, adored her son and gave him everything that she possibly could, and in return, Sertorius adored her just as much. It was in his late teens that he left his hometown and moved to Rome. At this time, it was very, very common for young men of the wealthier families who lived outside of Rome to move into the city and try their luck at a career in oratory or maybe becoming a jurist. Quintus became both, actually. Uh, but of little renown, nothing much is really said about his early times in Rome as a jurist or an orator, except for one quote by a young Cicero. Of all the totally illiterate and crude orators, well, actually ranters, I ever knew, and I might as well add completely coarse and rustic, the roughest and readiest were Quintus Sertorius. A quote from Cicero. So it seems he wasn't the greatest of public speakers or interpreters of the law, which most likely led him to join the military. Now his first campaign was under the command of the proconsul of Cisalpine Gaul, Quintus Servilius Caepio. And that campaign ended in disaster when Caepio, who was in command of his own forces, refused to cooperate and coordinate with the Consul Gnaeus Maelius Maximus, culminating in the Battle of Arausio, where on October 6th, 105 BC, the two Roman armies camped apart from one another because Caepio wouldn't do what he was told by the Senate, were overrun and some 60 to 80,000 Romans lost their lives. Sertorius managed to survive the battle, even with having his horse killed underneath him and receiving a serious wound. But, with his shield and armor intact, he managed to swim across the river Rodan, even with its strong currents, and made it safely to the other side, which garnered him some, you know, admiration and respect. All right, now I said I wouldn't go off on any tangents, but I just got to mention the story of when Caipio captured the town of Toulouse and found 50,000 gold bars, 
10,000 silver bars that had allegedly been taken from the ancient oracle at Delphi when the Scordisci plundered it back in 279. And apparently, on the way back to Rome, the gold bars were stolen, with many people believing that it was Caipio himself who had paid some brigands to do the job. Those 50,000 gold bars were never, ever found, and it's rumored that that gold was actually hidden away and passed down all the way to the final ancestor of Caipio, the infamous assassin, Brutus. After the disaster at Arousio, of course, Caipio was exiled, and the command of the rest of the forces and the war was given over to Gaius Marius, where Sertorius is said to have distinguished himself even more by disguising himself as a Gaul and making his way into the camp of one of the tribes that had defeated Caipio and gathering crucial information that would lead to the eventual victory of the Romans over the various assembled German tribes at the Battle of Aquii Sextii. Some historians interpret this spying mission as having happened the night before the battle, which would make it even more epic. And he probably also fought in the Battle of Vercelli, where the Cimbri were finally defeated. But besides that, there's nothing much more on him being involved with the war against the Germans. It's a few years after the war that we pick up the story of Sertorius. His patron, Gaius Marius, had begun to get on everybody's nerves a little bit by this time, let's just say that. So Gaius left Rome, and Sertorius followed his lead, but he didn't go with Marius. No, he went to Spain instead, where he served as a military tribune for the governor there, Titus Didius. He was in the city of Castellon in the south of Spain when a revolt kicked off, and the inhabitants of the city and a neighboring one killed all of the Romans they could get their hands on, except Sertorius and some soldiers managed to escape the slaughter. And when they were able to regroup and make a plan, they turned right back around and attacked the city's inhabitants. They killed all the men and sold all of the women and children into slavery, and the town that helped Castellon rebel in the first place suffered the same fate on the very next day. And for his actions, Quintus Sertorius was awarded the Corona Graminia, the Grass Crown. It was after some years in Spain, Sertorius returned to Rome, where in 91 BC he was elected as Quaestor and served in Cisalpine Gaul, where he was responsible for recruiting and training men for the upcoming social war, which he did apparently with enthusiasm and vigor, and later, during the actual fighting, he said to have performed great deeds of bravery, and he even lost an eye during one battle, which apparently he was quite proud of, with Plutarch saying, Sertorius used his wounds as personal propaganda. Being scarred in the face had its advantages. Other men, he used to say, could not always carry about them the evidence of their heroic achievements. Their tokens, wreaths, and spears of honor must at some times be set aside. But his proof of valor remained with him at all times. A quote from Plutarch there. After the social war, he returned to Rome, uh, pretty much a war hero at this point, and he attempted to run for Tribune of the Plebs, but Sulla screwed with his plans and blocked him, most likely not for personal reasons, but because Sertorius was in Marius' circle. But he did become a senator off the strength of his earlier quaestorship. Now, I'm going to skip some time and events, mostly the political duel duels between Marius and Sulla, to get to 88 BC, because going over all those events would turn... <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me, this into a Marius versus Sulla video instead of a video about Sertorius. But just know, if you don't already, these two men, Marius and Sulla, have been jockeying back and forth for control of the Republic. And Sulla is about to take his legions to the east to fight in a war against Mithridates. And now this war promises to be very lucrative, and whoever gets to lead it will become extremely, extremely wealthy and also very, very popular back in Rome. Marius, who's like in his fucking 70s at this point, uh, to make a long story short, bribes and connives his way into getting the Senate to relinquish 
Sulla's command of the legions, and give it to Marius instead. And of course Sulla, being the man who he was, didn't accept this outcome, and for the first time in Roman history, a Roman general turned his own troops towards the walls of Rome. So, it was in 88 BC that Sulla, after marching on Rome and murdering a few people, exiling a few more, Sulla left again to go fight his war in the east. But he never got to Marius. So while he was away, Marius and his faction regathered their strength. It was actually Sertorius and another man named Lucius Cornelius Cinna who recruited ex-legionnaires and get garnered enough support so that they themselves could take their turn at marching on Rome. And in the fall of 87 BC, with the army that they recruited, and also an army personally raised by Marius, they besieged Rome. And to save some time here, we will skip to the end of the siege, where it ended with the Senate giving in and making peace with the Marians. Though, both Cinna and Marius went along and had their political opponents either exiled or killed, which actually led to Sertorius rebuke both of them for what they had done. And when Marius passed away in 86 BC, it was Sertorius who actually destroyed the remainder of Marius' slave army that had been terrorizing the city of Rome. And in the year 84 BC, Cinna, who had angered his own men, was murdered by a mob of them. Plutarch gives a good little summary of how things were, or how things went down. Cinna was murdered, and against the wishes of Sertorius and against the law, the younger Marius took the consulship, while men as Carbo, Norbanus, and Scipio had no success in stopping Sulla's advance on Rome, so the Marian cause was being ruined and lost. Cowardice and weakness by the generals played its part, and treachery did the rest, and there was no reason why Sertorius should stay to watch things going from bad to worse through the inferior judgment of men with superior power. So basically, after Marius and Cinna died, Sertorius is like, I'm not fucking sticking around here with you idiots. Y'all have no idea what you're doing. And after falling out of favor with the new leaders of the Marians, Sertorius leaves Italy for Spain with an army at his back. And when he arrives, he takes control over the two provinces there to the dismay of Gaius Valerius Flaccus, who didn't really want to recognize his authority, which leads some historians to believe that he was a man in the sullen regime. But with his army behind him and his personal charisma, he got the local population there to look to him as the leader and not Flaccus. After gaining control of the country, Sertorius wanted to make sure he could hold it, so he sent a good chunk of his army under the command of his subordinate Julius Salinator, but this army was destroyed when trying to defend the mountain pass through the Pyrenees when an army under the command of Gaius Aeneas Luscus, one of Sulla's men. Sulla, by this time, had returned from the east and taken, uh, taken control of Rome for a second time. And now the Republic was completely under control of the Sullans. So technically, from this point forward, Sertorius and his men are rebels. Anyways, that army under Julius was destroyed when Julius was assassinated by one of his subordinates, who then defected over to the Sullans. A Sertorius, severely outnumbered now, took as many men, as many of his followers as well as he could with him, about 3,000 people, and then fled Spain to Mauritania. But when he tried to make landfall there, the locals came out and completely were just like, nah, get the hell away from us. We don't want no part in your damn rebellion against the Romans. And then somehow, he and his remainder that survived being driven off by the Mauritanians, uh, the remainder of his group fell in with some Sicilian pirates, where they all together attacked the tiny Balearic island of Hidiusa and made their base, or sorry, made that their base of operations. But when Annius Lucas uh, learned that this had happened, he sent a fleet of warships alongside a full legion, which easily drove Sertorius and his pirate friends from the island. Then the pirates ditched Sertorius and fled to Africa, but Sertorius followed them. The pirates, arriving in Tingis, 
pledged that they would help put a man named Ascalus on the throne. But Sertorius, seeing that the local population, he'd, he, he'd arrived a little bit later than them, seeing that the local population around Tingis didn't like this new tyrant, said that he would help them get rid of this puppet king. And with the support of the locals, he and his men defeated Ascalus and the pirates in a battle. Then he defeated the Roman general sent by Sulla to install Ascalus on the throne in the first place, which gained him much respect and adoration amongst the people of Tingis. And it was that fame that he gained in his North African adventures that caused the Louisitanians, a tribe from Iberia, to reach out to Sertorius and offer him the position of war leader against the Sullans and their regime who had been plundering their lands and oppressing their people back in Spain. This, finally, brings us to the Sertorian rule and the moment I started this story with. It took a while to get here, but I feel like I couldn't just start it at this point because it wouldn't really make sense. But now we can get back to the main story. As I said before, it was in 80 BC that Sertorius gathered his small force together and sailed them back to Spain. And on arriving in the vicinity of a coastal town of Malaria, a small Roman fleet under, under Aurelius Cotta tried to stop Sertorius and his men, but they were easily defeated. Then Sertorius carried on to a small fishing town named Bela, situated on the coast near the pil Pillars of Hercules, today's Straits of Gibraltar. He then called on his Louisitanian, Louisitanian allies to reinforce him, and when that was done, he marched out towards the sullen general, Lucius Fufidius, to take him on in the battle of the Betis River. And now, sadly, no accounts of the battle have survived, except for a small fragment from Sullust, which doesn't really describe the battle at all, but does make the terrain clear. The battle took place at the Estuary River, or sorry, the Estuary of the Betis River, and Fafidius held the poorer low ground while Sortorius used his local allies to gain the advantage in knowing where the best land to set up for battle was. And when all was said and done, Sertorius and his men were victorious, while Fufidius had lost 2,000 of his troops. And this is actually the last we ever hear from Fufidius in history, as he will disappear into obscurity and only ever be known as the man who lost Spain to Sertorius. After the victory, pretty much all of Hispania Ulterior was under Sertorius's control, and it's said that some of the Spaniards started to compare him to the famous Hannibal, especially with the missing eye, but also because of his generalship and abilities as a commander. Now, Sertorius, he wanted to consolidate his power more firmly in the southwest of Spain, so he sent his lieutenant, Lucius Hurtulius, the other uh, Roman province in Spain, Hispania Caeterior, to engage and defeat the sullen army there under the command of the new governor who had taken over after the Battle of Betis, Marcus Domitius Calvinus. Now Sulla, hearing of the defeats and now the growing threat of the Sertorians and his forces, uh, they upgraded, uh, the Senate and him upgraded Hispania Caeteria from a pro-Praetorian province to a pro-consular province, and Sulla personally appointed his consular partner of the year, Quintus Caecilius Metellus Pius as the governor, and made it clear that it was his job to rid the Iberian Peninsula of Sertorius and his followers. Now, Hertulius, he was using guerrilla warfare tactics against Calvinus's army while luring him further and further away from the coast and into the hinterlands, until, at the river Annas, a battle was fought, and Calvinus and his army disappeared from the records too. Either they lost the battle and he was killed, uh, his own troops might have defected and then turned him over to be executed, or they killed him themselves. But either way, Calvinus was no more. And it was in early 79 BC that Metellus finally arrived in Spain and based himself at Medellin. He's said to have been a commander to 
much more prefer to have his infantry in one large, big formation and use them to just grind away his opponents in long, bloody, hard-fought battles. And using this strategy, he gained himself quite the reputation as a general. But Sertorius was only a few years younger than him and actually held Metellus in very high regard. So he also used hit-and-run tactics and ambushes demoralized Metellus's army, and even challenged Metellus to single combat, which of course the elder man denied, but it did have the effect that some of his own men mocked him for denying the challenge of single combat. Now, without any strong hold in the central parts of Spain, Metellus, he set out to make some by fortifying any of the cities he got his hands on and making deals with local tribes so that they would ally themselves with him. This strategy is exactly the same one that Metellus's father used during the Jugurthine War, and he had served on his father's staff back then. But this was not enough because Sertorius was relentless in his hit-and-run campaign and with his ambuscades, eventually uh, forcing Metellus to call for aid. Lucius Manlius, the governor of Gallia Transalpina, tried to come to the aid of Metellus, but Hertulius defeated him in a battle and sent him packing back to his province. It was in the year 78 BC that Metellus besieged the town of Langobriga, hoping to make an example of the town and its inhabitants for allying with Sertorius. But Sertorius had learned of this plan beforehand and supplied the city with ample food and then laid waste to the surrounding countryside so Metellus's army would have nothing to forage for. And the plan worked perfectly, as Metellus's army quickly ran out of food, and he was forced to send a legion to scout for supplies. But when this legion was on its way back to camp, Sertorius ambushed them and forced them to abandon the supplies that they had just gathered. This, in turn, forced Metellus to break off the siege and mark ba uh, march back to the coast. Plutarch says that Metellus had only brought food for five days, and was hoping to deprive the town's inhabitants of water, so it would only take maybe two or three days for them to surrender. But Sertorius, apparently, was able to get 2,000 water skins into the city before it was put under siege, which completely thwarted Metellus's plans of a quick victory. It was also in the year 78 BC that Lucius Cornelius Sulla died of natural causes leaving his faction without a strong leader. So for the year of 77, not really uh, much happened between the two sides, as they seemed to be waiting to see what would happen back in Rome. Now to the year 76 BC, the Senate accepted a proposal from a man named Lucas Marcius Philippus that they should send his young son-in-law, Gnaeus Pompeius, the future Pompey the Great, who at this time had never even been a magistrate. But the two consuls of the year refused to take the command in Iberia against Sertorius, most likely out of fear that they'd be defeated and made to look like fools, which Sertorius had done to all the other generals who faced him so far. But Pompey was up for the challenge, and he raised 30,000 infantrymen and 1,000 cavalry and made his way into Hispania. In the same year that Pompey was sent to Hispania, Sertorius was reinforced by Marcus Herpena, who had been raising troops in Liguria when his men heard reports of Pompey heading to Spain. So, they actually forced their commander to pack up camp and head towards Spain to help Sertorius in the upcoming battles. Feeling like he could be more aggressive now with the 53 cohorts brought by Paperna, as well as wanting to stop Pompey from linking up with Metellus, Sertorius planned to march to and take the city of Laron, probably modern-day Alzira. Pompey, though, had arrived in Hispania and had been making his way up the coastal roads, clearing out any sullen, or sorry, any Sertorian forces in his way. Uh, he hoped that he could reach Sertorius quickly, force him into a pitched battle, and come out victorious. So even with Sertorius arriving at Laron first, Pompey headed straight there and set up his camp very close to the besieging camp of Sertorius, again hoping to force Sertorius into a large-scale pitched battle. 
So Sortorius decided to teach the young general a little lesson. After hearing that Pompey had sent messages to the people of Laron to enjoy their time and come watch the siege on the walls, as he would soon relieve them by defeating Sertorius, Sertorius ordered his cavalry and some light troops to start harassing Pompey's foragers in the nearby vicinity, but to leave the foragers that were further away alone. Now this led to the foragers getting tired of being attacked each day, so they moved all the foraging operations to areas farther afield. And this was exactly what Sertorius had expected, and exactly what he had wanted. One night, he ordered ten heavily armed cohorts of men and ten lightly armed cohorts out of the camp under the commands of Octavius Gracchinus and Tarquitus Priscus to lay an ambush for the Pompeian foraging parties. The Pompeians were returning from gathering supplies all night and were heavily burdened with goods when all of a sudden they were being attacked by Iberian skirmishers from the front, and as they tried to form into battle lines, they heard a shout from the forest to their side, and in the next moment, the heavy Sertorian infantry came crashing out of the brush and into their flanks. This charge completely broke the foraging force, and they all broke and ran for Pompey's camp. At this point, the cavalry was unleashed and began riding down the fleeing soldiers, and at the start of the battle, a small cavalry force of about 250 had beelined it right for Pompey's camp and were now making their way back up the roads and pathways, killing any Pompeian that they could find. When Pompey learned of what was happening, he sent out, uh, sorry, he sent out a legion under the command of Decimus Laelius to cover the retreat of his men. But they ran into the Sertorian cavalry, but they did manage to drive that off and out of sight. Then they came upon the infantry and started to prepare for a battle. But just as they were lined up, the Sertorian cavalry returned. They had circled around the back of the Pompeians and struck them in the rear with a vicious cavalry charge. And as the men in the legion turned to face the cavalry, the Sertorian infantry again charged from the front. And now they too broke and ran, while the Sertorians continued the massacre. Pompey, this whole time, had been getting his troops drawn up in battle formation, but by the time he was ready, Sertorius had already marched the remainder of his troops out of his camp and lined up for battle as well. Now Pompey had a choice to make. He could turn his men to face Sertorius and fight him, but then his retreating force would be completely wiped out, leaving him with much less of a fighting force than he would need to defeat Sertorius. Or, he could turn to try and help his fleeing men. That would open up his flanks and rears to Sertorius, who would charge with his men and cause massive casualties too. So, Pompey could only really do one thing. He just sat there, watching as his foragers and the legion that he sent to help them were cut down almost to the last man. It's said that Pompey lost 10,000 soldiers that day and was forced to return to camp. Sertorius, on the other hand, after his brilliant victory in the field, took the city of Laurent by force, which earned him quite a lot of wealth, but also prestige amongst his men and the people of Hispania. He showed himself to be quite the opponent for the Senate, and that this war was far, far from over. But Sertorius was forced to withdraw his men for the rest of the summer, because when he got reports that Metellus had been able to beat Perpenna and was now marching towards Pom or sorry him and Pompey, he didn't want to get caught between two armies. It was in the beginning of the spring of 75 BC, after a long winter of being encamped, Pompey and Metellus planned for the two armies that they commanded to take the same routes as the year before into the interior of Spain. So Metellus took his army down the middle of the country, aiming for Hispania Ulterior, while Pompey marched down the coast again. Pompey actually met no resistance until he entered onto the plain of Valencia, where he found Perpenna waiting for him, blocking the crossing of the Turia River. Perpenna thought this was his moment, and that he could defeat the young general and his army in a pitched battle 
so both sides drew up for a fight. And a fight it was. The entire battle is described basically as just a clash of strengths, stuck between the, the walls of Valencia and the river Turia. The two armies clash in an absolutely brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat that boiled down to a basic battle of morale and endurance, which in the end, the more battle-hardened and veteran troops of Pompey's legions won out. 10,000 men, this time from Perpenna's army, were lost. Sertorius, after hearing of the losses by Perpenna, decided to leave his forces with Hertulius and head south to take control of the situation there, leaving Hertulius to deal with Metellus. The two men were conducting operations around the Roman colony of Italica when Hertulius, feeling bold, forced Metellus into a pitched battle, thinking that he could win. It was one day, at first light, that Hortulius marched his men out of a camp that he had pitched very close towards Metellus. Then he drew them up in a battle order, trying to goad Metellus into a battle. Metellus, though, kept his men inside camp until the midday sun, letting the men of Hortulius' army sweat it out in the sweltering heat. He also took his time to study the battle array. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me the battle array of the army in front of him, and he noticed that Hertulius had placed all of his strongest infantry in the center, and he had just the plan for that. When the battle commenced, Metellus purposefully held back his center and concentrated on winning the flanks, which he was successful in doing, and when he saw his moment, he ordered his center forward and his two wings to turn, and converge on the infantry of Hertulius in the middle. They were surrounded, and killed almost to a man as well, though Hertulius did manage to escape. Metellus, using the same tactic as Hannibal did a hundred and fifty years before, destroyed twenty thousand men that day. Now, with the, the defeat of Hertulius, and him fleeing back towards Sortorius, Metellus, was following him close behind, and Sertorius knew that he had to defeat Pompey and defeat him quickly. Pompey, wanting to defeat Sertorius and take all the glory for himself, foolishly accepted the challenge, and the two armies met at the River Supro. Now, apparently, the night before the battle, it said that there was a huge thunderstorm, and as the lightning lit up the horizon from east to west, the soldiers from both armies looked on stealing themselves for the battle to come. With each general commanding their right flanks, the battle began with a clash of so swords and shields when the two sides of infantry met, and for some time there was hard fighting all across the line. And it was about halfway through the battle, Pompey and his men on the wing he was commanding began to win ground and push back the side of Sertorius's army that they were fighting against. Over on the opposite side of the line, Sortorius was made aware of the desperate situation on his left flank, so he left the right flank in charge of a subordinate commander and rode across the battlefield to help his man on the other side. His arrival on the scene gave uh, courage to his soldiers and inspired them to rally to their standards, and then when organized, they launched an absolutely beautiful counterattack at the Papian left flank, which shattered the morale and the fighting spirit of Pompey's men, and they began to break. Now Pompey, he tried his best to stem the tide of the retreating men, but even he was almost captured by the Sertorians. Apparently, the only reason why he wasn't is that because the Sertorian men chasing him stopped to capture his horse, which was, in their opinion, much more uh, worth, or sorry, worth much more than uh, some young random general. While all this was happening back on the side of the line Sertorius had left, Pompey's legate, Afrianus, had actually managed to push all the way to the Sertorian camp, and they were busy plundering it when Sertorius and the rest of his army returned. The men under Afrianus, um, they were pretty much sure that they had won, so they had started to pillage the camp, but when Sertorius and his men arrived, they must have known that Pompey had lost his battle on the right flank, and now they were surrounded. So Sertorius and his men are said to have descended upon these men with a vengeance, and almost all of them had their lives cut short that day. 
Pompey, though, he did manage to regroup with the survivors of his army and went back to his camp, where he must have been thinking about how to get out of the slaughter that was going to happen the next day when Sartorius and his men showed up. But news came that Metellus had broke through Sertorius' rear guard and was now making his way towards Pompey to rescue him and his beleaguered army. And due to the ferocity of the fighting on both sides, Sertorius had lost much too many men to fight two armies at once, even with Pompey's army being, you know, maybe half of what it was in the beginning. Now this obviously pissed Sertorius right off, as he had now missed his chance to take Pompey out of the war, and a quote is preserved um, about that moment on that day by Plutarch. If the old woman had not made an appearance, I'd have trashed the young boy and packed him off to Rome. Sertorius, now in danger again of being outnumbered, retreated with his men into the highlands of Celtiberia to return to more guerrilla tactics, sadly having to abandon the two coastal provinces he had fought so hard for. Pompey and Metellus, though, did follow him, and with Metellus's army running low on supplies, he decided to make a detour to the Celtiberian town of Saguntum to feed his army with their food and their supplies. Now, Sertorius had a quite sizable number of Celtiberians in his army at this point, and those men were adamant that they were not going to let a single Celtiberian city fall into Roman hands. So they pretty much forced a battle, uh, forced Sertorius to march there and then prepare for battle. It was obviously a battle that Sertorius didn't want to fight. And it's somewhere around this time that apparently Sertorius is said to have asked for peace, and that he would gladly just return to living as a private citizen. But of course, his offer was shot down when Metellus announced a bounty of about a hundred talents of silver on his head. And with a uh, battle, sorry, with a battle now forced upon him, the two armies met on the banks of the Duoro River, where for an entire day they would fight back and forth when Hertulius, Sertulius, Sertorius' legate, fell fighting against Metellus and his men. Sertorius personally led several attacks on Metellus's position, trying to get him out of this fight as well. In this savage fighting, Metellus actually was injured with a spear, but it actually seemed to have the opposite effect on his men. Instead of fleeing because their commander went down, they picked him up, carried him away on their shields, and then when he was safe, they turned back around and launched an all-out attack uh, with vengeance in their hearts and minds, it said, and completely pushed back the men in front of them and out of the battle. Now, as night fell, Metellus, he decided to just set up camp, but Tertorius, he was hoping to launch a surprise night attack and was getting ready to do so when Pompey and some random reinforcements came along and forced him to withdraw. Over the course of the battle, it said that Pompey and his men, um, before, uh, before abandoning the battlefield, lost 6,000 men, and Sertorius had lost 3,000, and his ally Peperna had lost 5,000 men. Uh, Peperna had taken over after Hertulius went down. Uh, but the losses of Metulius aren't really known, and again, as I just said, Lucius Hertulius, Lucius Hertulius, sorry, I feel like I said that wrong the first time, uh, Sertorius's second in command and good friend perished in the battle. Now, after this defeat, Sertorius, now he was severely outnumbered, and he couldn't hope to face Pompey or Metellus even in single, like, 1v1 army versus army. So he actually ordered his men to break up and regroup back at a designated spot while he took some forces to the town of Colunia and began to get ready for a siege, all the while sending out his messengers and other agents to gather more recruits and hopefully more allies. Getting to the year of 74 BC and the military actions taken in it, they're not really well documented, but it does seem like Sertorius kept Pompey and Metellus busy with the siege of Colunia, while again, his people were out trying to rebuild the army. And when he got news of these new recruits, apparently, that they were able to get, 
Sartorius somehow got himself and his men out of Colunia and joined up with them. Now, I don't know how he did that. It just says that he extracted them. So, like, I pictured, like, combat heli helicopters just, like, lifting them out of there like it was Afghanistan in 2023, maybe even the Vietnam scene. But I'm pretty sure that's not how he did it. And I probably also should have put this earlier in the script somewhere. But I'll just pop it in here. Um, Sertorius, Quintus Sertorius. So far, we've learned he's a great general. Smart, was a good leader, commands respect. But, you know, that respect has been earned, and his men all follow him with no questions asked. He's somebody who seemed to have great charisma and charmed. And though he was strict with his soldiers, it just made them better. And to the people that he was ruling over, it said that they actually loved him, and they made their lives easier by lowering taxes and stopping the raiding that was going on. And while he was in control of Spain, he attempted to put in place a stable government. He actually created a 300-member strong senate with his Roman followers, and most likely that also included some of the Hispanian nobles in there as well. Um... He even built a school for the leading chiefs' children to go to to hopefully learn about, you know, all the stuff that the little Roman kids did back in Italy. You know, he was much more of a, a guy just running around Spain kicking some Roman ass. He was out there trying to build something. Uh, his native followers, the people who weren't Roman, also thought of him as something more than a man, possibly. Or at least a man in touch with the divine. One day, a man named Spanus, a commoner from the area Sertorius was in at the time, came upon a spectacular white fawn. Now Spanus, hearing of Sertorius and how he would handsomely reward anyone who brought him wild game, chased down the fawn and captured it. He then brought this fawn to Sertorius, who accepted the gift, and in time, the fawn became so well-trained that apparently it would follow Sertorius around the camp. Sertorius Knowing how superstitious the locals were, um, he began to tell people the fawn had been sent to him by Diana, a Roman goddess, and that she would send him messages through it. He played into this little ruse by telling his men, you know, whenever he got news of enemy raids, that the fawn had come to him in his dreams and told him about it, or when he got word of a victory by one of his legates, he would gather the men all around him and make sacrifices to the gods, and then tell them, like, hey, be prepared. There's going to be some good news coming. Then he would apparently dress up the fawn in, like, I don't know, celebratory garments, it says. Sorry, I don't know, like a dress or something. And uh, tell his men of the victory. And, you know, say, like, oh, the news was brought by this fucking deer. And by doing this, it actually apparently seemed to work on his uh, Hispanian allies. But not really so much his Roman followers... And ever since the bounty that was put on his head by Metellus, Sertorius had, becoming, uh, had become much more distrusting of his fellow Romans. So, so much so that he switched his Roman bodyguard with a Louisitanian one. And it was at this time, a group of his Roman followers began to plot his demise. Now, there's various different reasons historians give for what's about to happen. Some say the assassins were tri uh, tired of guerrilla warfare. And they just wanted to have one big decisive battle, which would, you know, either win or lose the war for them. And Sertorius obviously was against that. Or apparently they wanted to make peace with the Roman Senate. Uh, some people even think that it was Sertorius who wanted to make peace and that the conspirators didn't. And some believe it was just the ruthless ambition of Peperna, one of Sertorius' commanders that we've talked about. But, whatever the reason was, sadly, Sertorius was not long for this world. Aperna and the conspirators sent a letter to Sertorius, telling him of a great victory, and that they were throwing a feast, and he should totally come, check it out. Sertorius, though, didn't really want to, but apparently after a lot of insisting on the part of the conspirators, he did finally make his way there. And I'll quote Plutarch again here, now on the death of Sertorius. When the drinking was already in full swing, the guests, who were looking for an excuse for a clash, spread their tongues and pretended to be very drunk, 
said obscenities, hoping to annoy Sertorius. Sertorius, however, either because he was displeased with the disturbance or because he saw from the insolence of their words and the unusual disregard for himself of the plotter's intent, only turned on his bed and lay on his back, trying not to notice or hear anything. Then, Perperna picked up the cup of undilu undiluted wine and sipped it, dropping it with a clatter. It was a signal sign, and immediately Antony, who was reclining next to Sertorius, struck him with his sword. Sertorius turned towards him and would have risen, but Antony threw himself on his breast and seized him by the arms. Unable to resist, Sertorius died under the blows of many conspirators. So they invited his ass to a party and then fucking started chirping him and um, trying to get him to attack one of them, it sounds like. But he just tried to ignore them and turn away. And when they did, or sorry, when he did, they all rushed him and stabbed him to death. Fucking can't trust anybody these days. After hearing about the death of Sertorius, some of his allies went to Pompey and made peace, while many of his Iberian allies just went home. Aperna was able to keep hold of some of the remaining Roman rebels, but it was by just barely a thread, and he knew that he needed a victory to achieve some sort of cohesion again. But Pompey, Pompey, sorry, <laughs> easily played him. He purposefully left ten cohorts in the path of Aperna's army, and when they came upon them, Aperna had his army charge after them. Of course, though, Pompey had planned for this and hid in the rest of his men in wait for an ambush. And when he gave the signal, his forces charged from their hiding spots, and the ten fleeing cohorts turned around and charged as well. Aperna's army was completely destroyed. After the battle, Aperna begged for his life. He even offered uh, Pompey all the correspondence that Sertorius had had over all the, all the years of the Civil War, all the different letters between him and what we can only assume would be some of the highest-ranking people back in Rome. Pompey accepted these terms, but when all the papers were gathered together, he burned them so that he could stop this civil war and hopefully avoid a new one. Then he had Perperna and all the men who assassinated Sertorius put to death. And with that, it marks the end of the Sertorian War. Now, finding out about this story and how many big names were in it, you know, we got Sulla, Marius, Pompey the Great, Metellus Pius, you know, there's a lot of big names from Roman history in here. It was really surprising to learn that, or to learn about it, and I'd be like, who the hell is this Quintus Sertorius guy? What is this Sertorian War? You know, I never heard of this stuff before, but, you know, I guess it just goes to show you that even in a civil war, if you're on the losing side, you're probably not going to be remembered. Of course, we do have Quintus Sertorius and some of his, uh, some of his commanders. But while reading this, there was a lot of times where he would have guy. It would be, be, be people on his side, and it would just be like unknown commander, you know, unknown this guy, unknown this person. And on Pompey's side and Metellus' side, it's every single but like just the most random people like the random commander on the right side or the left side of that one battle, he was named. But in the battle for Sertorius on his left flank, it just said unknown commander. So even in a civil war, if you're the loser, you're definitely not getting remembered. And of course, it looked like he was going to lose anyways, but maybe he wasn't, you know. Maybe if he wasn't assassinated, he could have brought it back like before Sertorius I'm talking about. And hell, you know, maybe we'd be learning about a Romano-Celtiberian kingdom that ruled Spain for a couple generations. Um, I don't think there was really any good or bad side in this war, like most wars. Um, most wars are just, as I think we can see here in this war, for land, money, and power. So I don't really have anything to say about the winner or the loser. I think Sertorius was a pretty decent general. Kind of sucks that he got assassinated at the end there, but, you know, it's kind of just what happened in Rome at that time. Um, 
And yeah, thank you guys very much for watching. I'm pretty much done talking here. My face hurts. So hopefully you guys enjoyed. And have a good one.